Um, we have already had lots of questions and I had a few lined up already. I'm going to try and wrap some of them up into sort of one larger question. So um, even though you've eloquently uh, talked about Google's um, reasons for getting involved with RCS, there's still a bunch of questions sort of trying to exactly establish where you fit in the ecosystem and what your business model is. So can you just address that for us? Absolutely. Um, I would, um, so our, our go-to-market is that for RCS itself and for launching with carriers, um, we do not charge for that service. Um, and we end up partnering with our carriers for revenue share for services, which do include at this point RBM. And, and so um, we want to see, uh, Tim, for the, the good of uh, Android ecosystem and to improve messaging, we want to see RCS cover the globe very quickly here. And so we want to get in and launch RCS uh, compatible systems. And then we're going to be adding services on as we go. And the first one here is what we're talking about today, which is business messaging. Our, our go-to-market for RBM um, is that we are going to market through our channel partners only. We're using these channel partners as our customers. And we are providing them in the future here when we get a handle of our customer interactions, of the end user interactions. Uh, we'll be, be providing our message partners with wholesale rate cards of which they then can continue to run their business and mark up and bundle and unbundle as they wish. Okay, and, and what are your thoughts on the different uh, charging methods? Um, given that obviously with SMS, you know, you're talking about uh, price per message, it's a bit more complicated on RCS with sessions and, and perhaps um, uh, consumer lifetime value and those kinds of ideas. So what are your thoughts on the different ways to charge both brands and um, operators? Yeah, great, great question. We have studied this and we have talked to every uh, brand messaging partner and carrier that we can. Uh, we've looked at every model you can imagine as far as, you know, monthly fee and message as much as you want to charge per user on the platform. Um, and and uh, what we walked away with is that there's a big concern of anything that would introduce free incremental messaging would be something that would introduce spam in, in unwanted messages is what we heard back from the ecosystem. Um, anything that uh, provided what we are now calling tailgating, meaning you're, you're able to throw in more messages at the end, we don't think would be a good customer experience from uh, especially all the messaging partners we've talked to. Um, so where we're at right now, and we are continuing to talk to people, but after a, a year of studying this, we, we think that there's, there's two pricing mechanisms that we will do here, and it will be guided by um, the use of the message of how it's done, meaning you don't have to pre-select which one of these you're going down. Uh, we will do the most cost-effective one. One is uh, there's a good group of people that just really want single messages. Um, temporary passwords um, used for verification is a great example. The last thing you want there probably as a brand is a conversation around your temporary password. You want that to be a single shot, one time message, very helpful, gets the job done, gets the app download. And for that, we do think we need single message pricing. Otherwise you're charging too much for that use case. Then Tim, the second side that we've seen is there, to your point, there does need to be session pricing here. We don't want brands um, uh, not knowing and not having predictability about their campaign. And we don't want some conversational commerce to be so conversational, it becomes uneconomic for them. So we've been doing a lot of research of what is the length of an average conversation that we can see in other modalities, such as you know, desktop help, e-commerce, chat, things like that to understand how long a conversation may last. Um, we, we still are getting input about how many hours that would be, 
But our notion is that there would be a set price for conversational messaging, which would cover a, a number of hours, and that those messages would not be counted at all. It would be unlimited messaging within that time period. Those we think are the two best ways to go to market at this point, and they are the ones that we think um, prevent um, uh, the most amount of spam. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, you, you mentioned in your uh, presentation that there are this is an addressable theoretical market of 1.9 billion subscribers at the moment, and there are lots and lots of analysts' projections around addressable market. I wonder if what, what's your best guess of how many people are actually using RCS now? Um, and I, if I can just sort of segue that to the subway example you gave, what, given that theirs was a live example, how many? How many RCS users were they able to reach in that in that um, uh, trial? Sure, I, I I think I can answer the first part. Um, uh, let let me go through that one, um, and and thank you for pointing out that 1.9 billion number. That is exactly as you say. That's the total addressable number of subscribers those carrier partners of us have. Uh, it's just added together. Um, so in there. Um, we do see everyone introducing RCS. When a carrier does do RCS, they want RCS on all of their devices. Um, we are busy um, pushing on the Android ecosystem. We are working with um, the OEMs uh, to put Android messaging as a default in on those devices. So at the time, and this is very important, and this is a change over the last four years that people sometimes miss, is that at this point, we're shipping uh, and OEMs are building devices with Android messages as the default messaging client in the hot seat. And that means that the customers who pick up those phones start using RCS as messaging. And there's nothing extra they need to do. They don't need to download something. They don't need to verify uh, something. Um, they're able out of the box to start messaging. And our research shows that once you start there, there's about a 97% to 95% stick rate of using that RCS client for the life of that phone. Um, and so as OEM starts shipping that, those numbers increase. Uh, one of the numbers that we have been sharing publicly now is the number of Android message clients out there in the world. So this is a client, Android Messages, which has SMS, MMS, and RCS all inside of the client. Um, all of our Android message clients are 2.0 capable, um, meaning the GSMA standard of 2.0, which, which allows and has the specs for MAP, for this conversational commerce. Um, and so all of them are ready to go. And what they're missing is sometimes they're missing the carrier back end. Um, but that number is 130 million around the globe that's either doing SMS, MMS, um, and waiting for the carrier to launch RCS, or they're already live with RCS. Um, that also can give you an idea of the numbers. I believe. Um, GSMA's numbers um, put it at about 200 million at this point on RCS around the globe. Um, and I, I think they were forecasting uh, ending the year uh, fairly high. And then next year, they're seeing a, a bigger growth. Um, those numbers make sense to us. They, uh, from what we see, we can see that happening. Um, getting more detailed, I'm afraid. We don't have enough carriers to anonymize the data um, uh, to be able to tell you these 12 carriers have this much. But I can tell you that in the markets uh, where we've launched RBM and where OEMs are shipping these units, all we have to do is wait for more units to ship and um, it converts over very quickly. Some of the examples uh, we've seen out there within RCS itself is a carrier can get usually within three years uh, close to 80% um, of their base, Android base, being on RCS. 
Um, okay, um, you, you mentioned uh, Android messaging there, um, Android messages. Um, how, just, just to recap very briefly how RSS fits within Google's messaging strategy, given that you have had or have um, other platforms like Hangouts and Allo and, and so on. And I believe you've just launched a new chat. Um, I don't know if it's a brand or just a shortcut for denoting RCS. Could you just tell us briefly about that as well? Yeah. Um, more than happy to. Um, at this point, Android Messages is Google's key messaging um, product. Uh, we did announce a while back that we are taking um, a fair amount of resources and adding them to Android Messages. At this point, we have a very, very large team. I would argue the largest team in the world working on a messaging client. Uh, we also benefit quite a bit um, by other areas within Google who help us on Android messages, anywhere from using some of our experts in machine learning on spam protection to also um, understanding um, user interaction and, and research within the UI. Um, and at this point, um, as we've been saying since roughly a little bit after Mobile World Congress um, in Barcelona, um, we are putting and doubling down on Android messages as the consumer messaging app for Google. Okay, great. Um, another question that's come in, which is sort of uh, integrates with one that I had prepared earlier was if, if this is a universal profile, then why would anyone What's the benefit of picking Google's over another platform? And uh, as an app to that question, um, are, are operators going to launch without Google support? Yes, yes. Okay, great question. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, there are many launches out there um, that are not Google's uh, launches per se. And um, there's also people that um, use different services from us. Um, some people will use Android messages, but they may have their own backend. Um, and then uh, most of the people that we deal with or we're working with are all using our hub uh, for interoperability. And so our services, because of the standard, um, because of what uh, the GSMA has put forward as a very good, complete um, spec here, uh, we are able to um, mix and match our technology solutions with other solutions. Um, the, the reason uh, that we think more people are turning to us than others um, have to do with a couple of things. One, um, the ability to launch quickly uh, with us. We, we can launch a carrier um, very rapidly at this point. Um, we come uh, to the table with a complete self-contained solution within our cloud um, that interops uh, very well with um, our client and in now, I believe, six different markets with the Samsung client as well. And so our back end allows carriers to launch quickly, get into the market quickly, and not tie up a lot of uh, capital and most importantly, not tie up a lot of internal work that needs to be done on integration point by point on network elements. Um, another kind of, you know, this is the classic strategy question, right? How, how do you work within a standard but differentiate yourself as well? Um, I, I think on the Android messages side, talking about the client now, um, we make sure our first uh, priority is to stay within the standard and be compliant with the standard. Um, and that's one of our first goals. Um, second is we do differentiate above that standard. The standard, um, as it should, does not dictate all things RCS. It provides a good common foundation of which services can interop together and provide good seamless service around the globe, despite what vendors. But anyway, on differentiating Android messages, there's a lot we add above and beyond the standard. It has to be compatible, um, but the standard itself does not dictate all things. It does not dictate all the possible services or 
um, what we call expressiveness, um, uh, which could be anywhere from uh, GIFs to emojis to different content. Um, so the standard itself leaves a lot of room to differentiate within. And I think that's uh, one of the areas that Google can really add and bring to bear um, some core skills and assets. Great. Okay, well, it's, um, it's an hour now, but we, um, we have so many questions and I believe our panelists have kindly agreed to uh, keep talking for a little more, while, little more. So I'm gonna ask a few more questions. I'm gonna jump around a bit, uh, forgive me for that, but we have so many questions and so many topics. I wonder if you could just address the um, issue of fraud um, in, in um, A2P messaging. It's obviously an issue that uh, the MEF is uh, devoted to, to combating. Um, can you tell us about how, um, what kind of fraud, anti-fraud measures there'll be in RCS? And um, I believe you have a registration system, which I think might uh, offer some clues. Absolutely. So we, we do consider spam or fraud. Um, there's many different aspects and angles of this, um, but we do consider all of that to be our number one priority. Um, uh, we, we really appreciate that um, all of this is opt-in. Um, we are uh, taking a page from uh, MEF and other people about what the best practices are. Um, we are complying to those. And the last thing we or this ecosystem uh, want is any sort of unwanted message messaging actually going to the um, going to the uh, end user. Um, and so, uh, Tim, as you said, we are combating that in many different ways. One way is um, to verify the sender and verify the sender is who they say they are and that the sender itself is a reputable um, uh, sender. Uh, we're doing that by verifying um, everything from the URL to understanding the business um, and how long it's been around, the nature of the business, any sort of uh, reputation elements that we could come to, to find out about it. And uh, this is a perfect example of where we can leverage a lot of different external resources and some internal resources to get the best picture we can on it. Also, um, thanks to the standard of 2.0 itself, there's a lot of elements within 2.0 of understanding and keeping that message um, true of what it was to be and where it was coming from. And also um, using things such as, instead of a short code, um, actually using um, things like the header being under the brand's name. Okay, so um, can, you, can you elaborate a little bit on the, the setup process for an enterprise and, and possibly even the cost as well. I don't know if that's something that is left to aggregators or whether you have any uh, involvement in that. Uh, yeah, perfect. I'll let Alex take that one. Yeah, sure. So first of all, uh, we, we have a relationship only with partners. We do not have direct relationship with brands. So we leverage partners, as we call them, to, uh, to actually uh, expose RBM agents and build the RBM experience for, for their own brands. And so the, uh, the onboarding process is fairly simple. So we first ask, we first of all kind of qualified partner and, um, you know, based on the reach, the, the number of direct agreements uh, that uh, you have with brands, also the locals, um, maybe the SMS um, connectivity to carriers as well. And, uh, and from here, once we have kind of pre-qualified you, then we onboard you. So there's a, what we call the RBM terms of services that we will ask you to to agree with and then uh, once you agree on it uh, we kind of provide you access to the rbm api that allows you to um, basically register on the platform and, and create your first rbm agent and and from here you can basically start building experience for your brand's customers so it's fairly simple and straightforward uh, we as todd mentioned before we have more than 100 partners today uh, on the platform uh, growing uh, every week um, and how will the cost compare with a standard SMS campaign? 
So, uh, as Todd mentioned before, so there's different, like we think that there will be like a transaction versus procession model. So today we are in the phase where we're negotiating with, uh, with carriers, the, the actual, um, you know, revenue share agreement. Um, and so the way it would work is that, uh, so as, as a technology provider, we, we actually share the revenues with carriers. And so now we are in that phase of negotiating the, the, the actual agreements. So that's on the carrier side. Then on the partner side, we would expose a, a red card based on what we could, we can negotiate with carriers. And so we cannot really share what the actual value of the termination, RBM termination will be. But um, as soon as we are ready, and, and, and of course it will depend on the, on the locals and maybe on the carriers as well. But as soon as we're ready, we will, uh, we will share that with our, with our partners. And what about the speed of setup, both for operators and um, for brands that want to set up a campaign? So the speed of setup, so, um, I mean, if you talk on the RBM side, I mean, it's, it's fairly simple. Like, you know, creating an agent is a matter of like, registering on the platform and creating an agent is a matter of like 48 hours. And then um, once, an, like, once you've, you know, discussed with your brand and like you've agreed with the brand on what's the use case and the, the, the experience that you want to provide, to the, the, that the brand wants to provide to their users, then uh, we ask partners to actually uh, submit a questionnaire describing the, the actual experience and then we go through it. We make sure that it's compliant with our policies. Uh, we also test the agents. So uh, once we've tested the agent, like we provide feedback to the partners, like to make sure that, you know, for compliance or for, or for a UX or for um, maybe, uh, you know, just feedback on the use case itself. It's actually, uh, it's actually making a good RBA use case. And then we're just ready, uh, we just allow, we just turn on the, the agent on the, on the carrier. So overall, like um, build, from building to testing and, and launching it is like a two to three weeks process. Okay. And what's your sense of um, RCS's um, uh, perception among um, consumers? There's a, there's, a, there's a sense at the moment that um, SMS is very much a business platform. Um, there's a lot of young people um, who will use Snapchat um, to talk to each other, but they will, and the only time they'll ever talk to use their SMS is, is when they're talking to their dentist or, or getting another from their airline or something like that. Um, do you see RCS having the same kind of trajectory in the sense that it will become a business to consumer platform and, um, and less so a P2P platform? Yeah, um, absolutely. That's a great question. And it, it does depend by market. Um, for instance, um, uh, the US market is very different from Brazil, as an example. Um, and we've done uh, research. Um, for instance, in the US, um, there's time here and there's evidence already of the success of the carriers of getting everything onto RCS, including um, P2P as well as business messaging. Um, and, and they, as a result, their mindset is much more, it's a, it's a one inbox for all. In the research we did down in Brazil several different times, I actually um, participated in some of it. Um, it, was a, it was very interesting what we heard in the Brazilian market. That's a very, heavily penetrated WhatsApp market. And the research we got back was that users kind of felt, just as you said, Tim, that on WhatsApp, that's for my friends, um, that is for me joking around and talking to family and friends, and that is social. But my, my carrier messaging is where I get my business messaging. And also there was this notion of perceived um, higher security with the carrier messaging than with WhatsApp. And I, I think uh, it, there's other markets in the world that are like that, where, where we would not be surprised if they are business messaging first for RCS, and then later with the success of that, that they start pulling in more P2P messaging. Okay, well that kind of leads on to my next question, which is one that is often asked around this topic and one which you've actually addressed in your presentation, which is the impact, the possible impact on apps, um, given the cost of develop, developing apps and the ineffective of some, ineffectiveness of some of them. Do you see RCS messages as a kind of, uh, each one as a kind of mini app that um, 
that businesses can use um, to avoid the, the cost and to be more effective than, than using apps. And if, ca if that's the case, what would the impact be on Google Play? Um, yes, on, the, um, on that uh, side of things, the application question does come up all the time. And one of the things that, um, that we've noticed is um, there's been a lot of money spent on the applications. The applications are very robust. They have a lot of information in them um, and they can go into great detail. Um, some of the better use cases we've seen is where the app is in fact complementary to the messaging. Sometimes these applications don't drive enough traffic to them as the brands would like, but they're, they're filled with, um, with great high quality graphics, good information and so forth. Through suggested actions um, that we talked about earlier, we can deep link from the messaging world into the application at the point where the brand wants to. So if, if I've communicated to you, let's say you're a carrier and I've communicated back and forth within the messaging app on a question I have about my service and, and it makes sense that for the next thing that I'm still not quite getting it, um, you could direct me into your application through simply a suggested action at the bottom of your last message and then I can go and find more information and go deeper in that topic within the application. Um, and, and we've seen that used. We've also seen um, that a, a, a messaging back and forth with RBM uh, could be used to drive app downloads. Um, and a application could be used to um, jump out of the application into a messaging flow um, at the right time that the brand wants. So we, we do see them complementary. Uh, there's no question that some of the activity and some of the customer exchanges should be on the messaging side. Um, it, it's easier to get, it takes up less footprint on the app side, et cetera. But on the other hand, there's a still a good role for applications themselves in this ecosystem. Okay, uh, thank you. Last question. Um, as I said earlier, there's, there's no end of um, uh, speculation and, and a lot of projections around this market. I just would like to hear from you guys. Um, what's your um, guess, best guess of when the tipping point might come for RCS? And, and what, roughly what kind of percentage of uh, customers in a country should have access to it in order for that tipping point to actually take place? Yes, and on the tipping point, are you talking about tipping point on peer-to-peer -peer or a tipping point on RBM? Because we, we think they're uh, different. Well, let's hear both. Okay, why not? Um, <laughs> sure, on peer-to-peer, on, on -peer, um, we think it has a lot to do with the network density. Um, and that is going to be very much uh, country by country, if not even network by network. Uh, for instance, th there's, there's tons of data out there that at least, for instance, in the U.S., because the U.S. is filled with different family uh, plans and things like that, that you may have six, seven lines on one account, and that when that group of people go in to change out their phones, they all walk away with new RCS phones, and before you know it, they're active RCS users, even within that small of a circle. And so on this side, it has to do with very small density of folks communicating directly. In the US, this could be regional. In a smaller country, it could be just countrywide. And, and that's what it takes to get a tipping point. And we think the tipping points there will be these communities, regions, or very small countries. The brand, on the other hand, the brands are more and more global. Um, business messaging is done at a minimum at a regional level, um, especially when you get outside the U.S. in other places where the brands buy and media buys and campaigns and promotions run on a multi-country basis um, uh, for different re regions. And as a result, that tipping point is you, you need a higher, you need, you need a, a higher reach across more territory.
for that to hit a tipping point. And for that, um, I mean, we're, we're trying to learn our, ourselves, but in talking to brands and talking to our messaging partners, um, some of it looks like uh, 10% would end up uh, flipping it around and causing a tipping point. And, and one of the, there, there's a couple of key points of why this is so low of a percentage as a tipping point. Um, one is it's not a lot of work to change the medium here. We, we aren't talking about reinventing a TV spot to a 15 second TV spot where, where you have to put a lot of work and a lot of energy into it and it comes with heavy, heavy production costs. Um, the barrier here to move a successful SMS campaign into a successful RBM campaign is, is not that much work. You, you need to get very clever on the user flows. Um, you need to get a little bit creative on graphics, which is new. If you've been using 160 characters, you haven't had to think about graphics. But the cost of entering into this campaign for the incremental lift is, is not too much. So the kind of cost benefit ratio here is much more prone to an easy access for brands to start testing out into using. And a lot of the brands that we're working with now are, are learning right now how to use this technology, how users start interacting with it. And here in the third quarter, we're gonna start A-B testing, not SMS against RCS, but RCS uh, creative A against creative B to see what actually pulls the highest response rates. And given that these read receipts usually all happen within 24 hours, um, the marketer is able to see the results immediately through different analytic tools to understand what's pulling the best and, and how to change it. Well, I think we'll all look forward to seeing the results of those tests and um, good luck with those. Um, we've had uh, an hour and 15, so I thank uh, the panelists very much for um, spending a bit of extra time to answer our questions. Um, we're gonna wrap up the webinar there, so I'm gonna say thanks to Todd, to Alex, and to Gabby, um, and to thank you all for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. And thank you very much.